This morning, if you would open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, we'll start at the beginning today, <clears throat> and I'll preach the whole way through the scriptures. No. I won't do that. This morning, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. This morning, I want to speak to you about being naked and afraid. Naked and afraid. And my disclaimer this morning is, is I have never seen the te- television show on the Discovery Channel. I don't care about it, won't reference it. And uh, so you can be secure in knowing that. Um, And if you didn't know there was a television show called Naked and Afraid, maybe you're better off for it. There was a pastor who went out one morning on Saturday to visit his congregation. And uh, he saw several people that day as he visited them at their homes on a Saturday afternoon. And then uh, he came to one particular member's house that he thought for sure that he would see that day. And he knocked on the door. The car was in the driveway. The garage door was open. It seemed like all the lights were on, that certainly that person was there. But the pastor knocked on the door repeatedly, and nobody ever answered. So in his uh, frustration and being a little bit passive-aggressive, he took his card out and wrote the Scripture, Revelation 3.20 on it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody is there and answers my voice, I will come in and sup with him and he with I. And so he shoved it into the door there. And then the next day on Sunday morning, he surprisingly got the same card back in the offering plate. But on the bottom of that scripture written there was Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. I heard you walking in the garden. But behold, I was afraid and naked, so I hid myself. Today, I want to look at a scripture that you've probably read a thousand times. A scripture and a story that you heard from your little kid if you grew up in the church on the flannel graph in Sunday school. A scripture you've probably read in its genesis, if you will, in the beginning hundreds of times. But I wonder if sometimes that we need to do a close reading of the scriptures. Not just glaze over it, not just read our three chapters a day, but really just go in depth in the scriptures to see what God has to say to us. I think in addition to that, we can also look at the fall of man and this story Not as just some theological happening of why we sin and why the world is broken and fallen apart and in need of a Savior. But I think we can look at the origins of fear itself. It says he was naked and afraid. Where is the first happening of fear as it begins in chapter 3? And we can look at it and see how to remedy the fear in our lives itself. So if you would, read with me this lengthy passage of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees, the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die. Really, the better translation there, instead of just an explicit lie, he was crafty, he was shrewd. Uh, The better translation should probably be that... Are you sure that God said that you would die? He was questioning it, trying to create doubt in her mind. Verse 5, For God knows that in that day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from the fruit and she ate. And she gave also to her husband and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Verse 8, And there they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You know, in our world today, it seems like nobody is at fault for their actions. You know, we, we live in what people will call this sort of victim mentality, uh, our victimized culture. Uh, this is obviously not a new phenomenon. Literally, at the beginning of creation, we see this victim mentality. It's not me, it's somebody else. It, it's a, 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 in the origin or this primal behavior in our own DNA, it seems like, that we have this nature that wants to blame somebody else. And uh, uh, maybe the epitome of this story is in uh, Charles O'Brien's story. He was the New York uh, governor's top aide and right-hand man. And in 2008, he was uh, resigned from office publicly because it was found that he had spent five years of not paying his taxes. His lawyer announced his resignation, saying that he didn't want to inhibit the governor's work, but said that he owed over $300,000 in back taxes. And then he went on to say that the reasoning, or at least part of the reasoning, for his lack of paying his taxes was that because he suffered from a syndrome, like some type of medical or psychological syndrome, that wouldn't allow him to pay his taxes. If you can't blame it on somebody else, let's blame it on some type of disability that you have, right? And, and, and I wonder what the name of that medical syndrome or psychological syndrome is. I, I, greed? It would, would that be the right name for it? You know? Uh, when we lived in Florida, uh, we were on U.S. 19, and, and man, there's billboards everywhere. I mean, if you think we have too many billboards in Frankfurt, go to Florida. They're absolutely everywhere, and they're for everything under the sun. And uh, one of the billboards I saw that was particularly catching to me uh, was there was a picture of this doctor, and then next to the doctor uh, was this quotation that she had obviously made. And the quotation was this, it's not your fault that you're overweight. And I just, I said to Beck, we're driving around, and I said, I looked up at that, and I said, I'm the one that likes cookies. You know what I mean? It's my, it's, I'm the one that, right, uh, uh, likes food enough to the point where I overeat. And uh, what is it about our culture that wants to blame absolutely everything or even about our human nature that wants to blame everything on somebody or something else so that we don't take any responsibility for our actions, ultimately for our sins. It seems awfully primal to me when we read the Scriptures. In these first few verses into the Scriptures, you see the blame game on the whole unfold before you. I didn't do it. She did it. I didn't do it. The devil did it. And this is much the same problem of our culture today. Everybody's a victim. It's not my fault. It's the economy. It's not my sin. It's uh, somebody else made me act this way. One of the biggest maturity markers, I believe, in life, because I deal with four- and six-year-olds all the time, that nothing's their fault. He made me do it. Or when I punish them or they get in trouble, it's you're making me cry. That's what they say. No, you're the one crying. You are dealing with the consequences of your behavior. Right? And so the marked level of maturity is when people begin to take responsibility and say, Yes, I am desperately wicked in my own heart. And my heart is filled with sin and envy and strife and greed. And oh God, I am in need of somebody to save me from the wickedness of my own heart. But until we come to that place, not like Adam and Eve did, there will be this human default to blame somebody else. But rather, we should own up to our sin and simply say, Lord, I am in need of a Savior. And if we do not do this, I believe we'll continue to flounder around in this life, never knowing, never gaining, and never being truly free of any fear that plagues our minds and our hearts. And the Genesis author exposes the fundamental problem with humanity here. In verse 6, Eve looks at the fruit, sees it's edible, sees that it's pleasing to the eyes, and then she says this kind of enigmatic statement, if you will. She says that the fruit was able to make them wise. That's interesting. 
And she sees the fruit, and she, she gives, eats the fruit, and gives it to Adam, and Adam eats the fruit, and then they finally realize that they were naked. So the author of Genesis is actually making a play on words here. Adam and Eve will seek themselves to be shrewd, but discover themselves actually to be nude. Now, even in the English, this works, but if you would put up the Hebrew words, you'll see the actual translation of the words that the Genesis author is saying they wanted to be shrewd, but they realized in their humanity they were actually nude. One basic little character in the Hebrew is the difference. And so we see ourselves in the fullness of it, that even in the English, the rhythm of the wording, uh, nude and shrewd, but at our core and human understanding, we will seek in life to find wisdom, only to gain wisdom, and in our newfound wisdom, realize how unwise we really are. Maybe the epitome of wisdom is really realizing how unwise our human hearts and minds actually are. Maybe the most wise thing that we could be or act as is humble before the Lord. I remember the day, uh, I mean, I remember it vividly in my mind that I was accepted into graduate school. I got that email and I just told everybody. I didn't care who they were on the street. I said, I was accepted into graduate school. I had some doubts, obviously, that I would be able to be accepted Uh, um, and... uh, As I begin this process and all the excitement of, yes, I'm starting school, I'm starting a different level of school, then it came to the time when I have to sit before the professors, read the books, and uh, do the papers and tests and everything else, and I realized amidst all of that uh, wisdom-seeking process how dumb I really was in the first place. And all the excitement is dashed in my hopes of being smart or wise really are, the further the you go in education, the further you really go in Christian discipleship, you realize the depth of your own heart's inability to do something great. And when you receive wisdom, you realize how much wisdom you lacked in the first place. And at the core of our human understanding is that we are so unwise that we have been duped by the beastly uh, serpent of the field. Ultimately, we have all chosen to follow the serpent's selfish deception than to follow the Lord's original commands. I remember a song from high school back in the 1990s. I think very fondly upon the 90s. I don't know about you all, but it was my formative year, so I think fondly upon that time, pre-9-11, pre-all the world's turmoil that is. Uh, You could fly on a plane without going through security like you do today. You could uh, drive your 1990s vehicle down the road with your music blaring and nobody would give you a ticket or try to kill you or anything like that. Uh, The world has changed vastly, I think. Um, But the lyrics of this song were uh, obviously in their own way enigmatic. And uh, from the best that I could tell, there was meaning behind them and the lead singer's own life. And then I actually read some blog posts that the singer had made and found that there was truly meaning that I had uh, anticipated behind them. This is along the same lines of Eve's very own thinking and Adam's very own thinking. The song by the Verve Pipe, Brian Vander Ark, the song was called The Freshman. Many of you remember it, but let me quote you the lyrics now. When I was young, I knew everything. And she a punk who rarely ever took advice. Now I'm guilt-stricken, sobbing with my head on the floor. Stop a baby's breath and a shoe full of rice. No, I can't be held responsible because she was touching her face. I won't be held responsible. She fell in love in the first place. Think of this in the context of the Genesis story. For the life of me, I cannot remember what made us think that we were wise. And we never compromise. For the life of me, I cannot believe we'd ever die for these sins. We were merely freshmen. Vander Ark is describing this experience from his own life. The guilt that he is feeling is subsequent blame shifting is for the abortion of his unborn child of then his girlfriend. Listen to the words. Stop a baby's breath and a shoe full of rice. I can't be held responsible because she was touching her face. There will be no breath in the child's lung. There will be no wedding. 
But it's not my fault. It's she who seduced me in the first place. I'm not going to die for these sins. It's she who fell in love with me in the first place. And this is the same basic logic that Adam had also. I broke your commands, God, but it was because of her. It's the woman's fault. And you put uh, her here with me. So maybe, God, you're to blame also. And in the same pattern, the woman shifts the guilt and puts it on the serpent. The Romans 122 says it may be best, although they claim to be wise, they became foolish in their actions. And the grim reality of the world does not want to face is, is that your guilt is indicative of the fact that you will die for your sins. And that guilt is what I believe is like C.S. Lewis said, pain is like a megaphone calling out to you in the guilt of your own heart that you would cause, uh, become to repentance. And so God calls out to us in our own guilt, in the conviction of the Spirit, so that we might be saved. However, the beauty is, ultimately, that Scripture does not leave us in that despair. Because you die unless you allow Jesus to shift all of your guilt, all of your sin, all of your pain from your shoulders and onto His shoulders, so that He can ultimately hoist it to the cross and then let it be nailed there forever. Hebrews explains it well. The goats and the bulls, the blood of goats and bulls can never take away the guilt, can never take away the shame of sin, but only the blood of Jesus can take away the shame of sin. And God's command is that if you touch the tree, he said to the woman and to Adam, if you touch the tree, you will die. But the serpent is good at dealing out half-truths to Eve. Isn't the world great at dealing out half-truths to us? It has a little bit of truth that make you believe it, but then yet wrapped around and shielded and shrouded inside of that half-truth, there is a lie. I think that goes along with Romans 1 also. It's good to be shrewd and wise, but it isn't good to use those very same attributes to seduce people into doing wrong that you want to do to them. The snake never demands that she should eat, uh, 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 but only suggests her in that direction. The snake tells her that she will be like God, knowing good and evil. But it's a similarity with God that she desires uh, will only work against her because it's the same knowledge of good and evil that will ultimately serve to separate her from God. And so she desires one thing, but here it is again. The half-truth gets her another thing buried deep within it. And the weight of all the fear that they feel begins to fall upon their hearts. They are separated from God. They're naked. They're poor. They're helpless. They're thrown out of the garden. They sew fig leaves together to try to remedy the situation, which all proves futile. And they still know that they're naked. And they know they've done evil. And fear begins to uh, be born into their hearts at their brokenness of relationship with God. Why is it that when you're learning any type of public speaking, anybody takes speech in college or something like that, high school, that some people, it never seems to fail, somebody will come to you and say, this is how you can transcend the fear of public speaking. Picture everybody in the audience naked. And I promise you, I will never do that. I have never done it. It, de- it seems futile in my mind, Okay. But that seems to be the baseline denominator of the uh, uh, of getting over your fear of public speaker. Picture everybody naked. And in this kind of uh, uh, desire to uh, kind of even the playing field, I think is what it is. Because when a person gets up to public speak, they'll look at themselves and they say, I'm anxious, I'm fearful. And then all of their kind of desire of, uh, of to be something great is dashed by the fact that they feel insecure in their own ability to speak in public. And so they say, okay, so picture everybody naked so you can put them on the same level of shame and guilt and uh, 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 somebody out there in that audience, I'm sure, is going to look worse than you look. As you put that picture in your mind, you see the foul thinking of human nature? 
Let's compare ourselves to somebody else. Let me tell you something. Comparisons never work. Because there is only one person that you ever need to compare yourself to ever in this life. And that's Jesus Christ. And the reality of that comparison is is that you're always going to fall short. There is no pride when you compare yourself to Jesus. Because he is the perfect and sinless one. But when you compare yourself to other people, uh, then obviously you can find yourself uh, um, with this massively foul thinking. I've recently spent some time uh, in prison, not because I had to, but because uh, I wanted to. (laughs) I don't know if that sounds right either, but... uh, got into the federal penitentiary uh, and I preached there on the 14th. Pray that that will be a move of the Spirit that night. Um, I think I'm going to preach the same sermon that I preached on Pentecost Sunday. I'm just believing God will just fill that prison with His Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, And one thing I've noticed that as I visit jails or prisons and things like that uh, is, is that A lot of people will spend a whole lot of time in that same type of futile comparison syndrome, if you will. They'll go in and and they'll speak to me. And I I usually just shut up and let them talk most of the time. Because they don't get to talk to a lot of people on the outside. So I let them speak to me and then I kind of try to give my words of wisdom if I had any. And so as they talk to me... What I notice is pretty normal is everybody in prison is innocent, for one thing. And uh, on top of that, there is always somebody that's done something worse than they have, and they're going to point it out. What is it about human nature that wants to compare? I mean, it's like I've got to press everybody else down. It's the whole idea of picturing the audience naked. I've got to bring them down to my level. Not even my level, but below my level, so that I feel a little bit above them. And so here's this human nature that's exposed in the Genesis 3 account. But it's flawed in its thinking that we only need to compare ourselves to Jesus Christ. And so just recently I went to the uh, chaplaincy convention with Brother Tom Caldwell, the prison chaplain that uh, got me into the prison in the first place. And I love Tom Caldwell. He's a phenomenal preacher, isn't he? Aren't we blessed? Aren't we blessed to have Brother Tom with us? I mean, it's like getting two pastors for the price of one, right? I mean, he, he's just awesome. And he's a great preacher. And he inspires me and to be uh, better. I mean, I feel, I haven't talked to him about this, but a little bit like David and Jonathan to some degree. Uh, so we spent uh, uh, three or four days the other day at the chaplaincy conference together. Just had a, a phenomenal, spirit-filled time. Uh, but one of those sessions that we had was with John Bevere. Anybody know John Bevere, like John Bevere? Uh, he's good, but I never really liked him. I don't know what it is about him. I, could, I, had, I had trouble going into those meetings with John Bevere. He uh, uh, spoke on honor in one of those sessions, and some people loved it and some people hated it. And then, uh, you know, I've seen him in Florida. He came to Christ for the Nations when I was there for a whole week long. His wife's a better preacher than he is, if you ask me. Um, (laughs) But, I mean, this whole time I'm praying about it, thinking about it. It's like, what is it about John Bevere that just rubs me the wrong way? Maybe the way he preaches or his style or something like that. And then all of a sudden the Lord dropped into my heart. He said, Scott, he's not an evangelist. He's not a pastor. He's a prophet. And then all of a sudden, I see him up there in front of this entire congregation of all these uh, wonderfully well-educated, disciplined chaplains, and I see him point his little bony finger at me. And all of a sudden, in my mind, I got this uh, vision of Nathan the prophet pointing his little bony finger at David and saying, you are the man. He's a prophet. Even the name of his ministry speaks of it. It's Messengers International. Messenger International. So all of a sudden, okay, I realize this in the middle of this kind of uh, sermon, his homily, and I, and I say, okay, Lord, I realize he's a prophet, and I guarantee you he's got something to say that I do not want to hear. And that's why people don't like prophets. It's not because they're a little bit nuts and they probably don't wash themselves and, you know, things like that. It's because people that carry the gift of prophecy are usually going to share a word with you that you don't want to hear. 
Look at the, the scriptural overarching pattern of a prophet. They come, they're hated. I mean, not just, they kill them. They slaughter them because they hate them. Because they say things they don't want to hear. Jesus, the greatest prophet of all, was nailed to a cross. Right? And so here in this context, I realize it. I say, thank you, Lord, for that. And then I sit down and I try to listen and accept what he has to say. Talks about honor. And then he talks about how we've probably dishonored somebody at some point in time. And I realized as he pointed his bony finger, just like Nathan did to David, I've dishonored people. And all of a sudden, in that context, I realize in a prophet's presence how naked and poor and wretched my heart really is before God. I'm exposed. This is the reality of what Adam and Eve are experiencing at that moment. They realize the wickedness of their own hearts. They're exposed. They're naked as far as the physical attributes go. But really what's exposed is their hearts and the blackened sinfulness of their very own heart. And so at that moment I feel like Adam and Eve is that I, in the pit of my stomach, just like Adam and Eve felt the fear and the nakedness for the first time, The snake's promises all come true, but in a very different way than they expected. The first experience of fear in the world comes from a disobedient, broken relationship with God. And this herein lies the whole problem of human nature. And I would go as far to say that all fear in the world stems from a brokenness of relationship between an individual and between God. If you're struggling with fear this morning, quickly in your mind, just begin to track backwards to its origins. And I guarantee you at the genesis of the origin of that fear, you will find a broken, shattered, and distorted place of your relationship with God. And that's where all of that fear begins to stem from. So my question to you this morning is, is I'm not finishing, but let me at least say this. Do you feel a little bit like Sisyphus, the Greek mythology, rolling a stone up a hill for it to only be condemned to roll back down again? Are there places in your life where you feel fear and that fear just doesn't go away? It comes, uh, you think you get to a breaking point where it's gone. You've rolled the stone of fear in your life over top of the hill and then all of a sudden it comes rolling back down upon you. It's time to come clean. It's time to look for the brokenness of that relationship with God. Maybe it's a lack of faith that God is handling your life well. Maybe it's a lack of faith that that God loves your children more than you love your children. Maybe it's a lack of faith that God can and will heal you. Maybe it's a lack of faith that I'm not going to be able to make it through. I'm not going to be able to get through this moment. But the truth is, Adam and Eve did, and so will you. In the automotive history of uh, cars, I love cars, and I actually love, I have a great love for the 1990s vehicles, believe it or not. I don't know what it is about those cars. They were just built out of total and utter pragmatism, I think. You know, the windows were nice and high. They didn't care about aesthetics. You look at any car from the early 1990s, and they're they're ugly as sin, really. But you know what? You get in one, and you just feel comfortable. You know, it's just... The windows are high, you know, you can turn the air conditioning on, and it's not going to decide for you how cold you want it in the car. It's not going to tell you where to go. It's not going to tell you what to do. You know, it's not going to put the brakes on for you. You control the vehicle. I like that. Right? Plus, on top of that, I can't, it blows my mind that in 1990, Toyota Corolla could make a car that got 37 miles to the gallon. And in 2017, they make the same exact vehicle, Toyota Corolla, and it gets 37 miles to the gallon. No difference in 30 years. How in the world, uh, something's not right about that, right? 30 years of technology, 30 years of of all this change in the automotive industry, and nothing changes, right? Plus, I think there's just something about, uh, you know, rolling down the road with my middle parted hair in the 1990s. Parted right down the middle, you know? 
Old school, baby. <laughs> parachute pants on. Yeah, I wore parachute pants in the 1990s. My mom custom made them for me in the 1990s. I was a late bloomer. That's all I can say. You know, it was an 80s fad, but I wore them in the 90s, baby. Bringing them back. Something was just good about those days. I don't know what it is. But something happened in the automotive industry at the early 90s. Is that's on um, engine technology and belt technology. They went from uh, usually two to three different belts that drove all the accessories, the alternator, the power steering pump, and things like that. They had two or three different belts. And then they went to what was called a serpentine belt. So the serpentine belt was just like it sounds. It wrapped itself around every single accessory, every pulley, the water pump, the the crankshaft, everything. It wrapped itself all the way around every pulley with one single uh, belt. And it was much more uh, uh, efficient in a lot of ways. And obviously you had one belt instead of three. That was a good thing. But, but... As you begin to examine this kind of serpentine idea, you look at Eve and you say, how in the world did she let that serpentine conversation just begin to wrap itself around her heart and then around her mind and then around her body until it became an action where she picked the fruit up off the tree and put it in her mouth in direct disobedience to God's command. And suddenly, it all changes in that she was letting God drive her with His commands and His word. And suddenly, the serpentine conversation wraps itself around her. And the conversation changes. And now, the serpent himself is driving Eve's actions. This is obviously the danger of everything and the danger of ourselves. Uh, 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 we talked this morning about, I hate, uh, uh, Brother H- Hammond said, I hate being ignorant. You know, most of the time is, is that when you're ignorant of something, you don't know that you're ignorant, right? Isn't that the whole problem? The reality is, is that in this, uh, in this life, that I can be so easily twisted and, and changed by that little half-truth. And wrapped up inside it is a lie. And all I have to do is just let that belt come on to my mode of thinking, into my heart. And then suddenly I realize that it's not me acting, but it's what the sinful of my own heart's acting is. And there's this dichotomy, if you will, between what I desire to do and what my body will do or what my mind and what my heart wants to do. And Paul, the apostle said it like this. I do what I do not want to do. And I don't do what I want to do. It's the same enigma. It's the same issue of all of our Christian lives. The Hebrew writer, I think, is doing so much more. And we miss all of this if we don't take a time to look at the nuances of the Scripture and the text itself and do a close reading of it. And so he sees and he draws the contrast that we can easily miss if we are to read the text not very closely. Their eyes are opened, but they're hiding in the trees. The fruit is good for food, but ultimately it kills them. They sought to be wise, but they find they are naked. They perhaps, the sharpest contrast is is that Adam chose to listen to his wife rather than to listen to God. God is one who created and saw that it was good, but Eve takes the fruit and saw that it was good. God took the rib from Adam's side and Eve takes the fruit from the tree. And the penultimate problem with humanity I see in this scripture is is that we are as humans usurping the divine prerogatives that we have no business doing in the first place. It's God that saw that it was good. It's God that designed it, not me who designed it. And all of the fear of this life has its essence in this very ultimate problem. We try to take control of something that only God has the ability to handle. And they are blatant acts of disobedience. God has provided everything for humanity, but now we see them as making a loincloth for themselves. Adam and Eve's eyes were open, but they did not see what they had hoped for. 
What they saw was the nakedness of their own hearts before God. Sinful, dirty, disobedient, ultimately in need of a Savior. So God comes walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Can you imagine what that will be like in heaven for God to walk through our presence in the same world, in the same place? And I pray, oh God, that you would walk through this congregation with your presence this morning. So God is walking through the garden in the cool of the day, something he would do most naturally. I long for the day when he will naturally do that again. The Hebrew writer doesn't portray God as this omniscient, great creator, but rather he uses this to his advantage to show the ignorant childlikeness of Adam and Eve. Like when we play a game of hide and seek with our children. My kids will hide in the house somewhere and I'll say, Where are you, William? Where are you, Whitney? Where are you, Wesley? But yet it's fully evident to me what's actually happening. I mean, they're hiding behind the couch and under a cover, but yet I can see their feet hanging out below them. They have no idea. I can hear them giggling audibly as they're trying to hide from me. Uh, It happened Friday afternoon. Becca sent me a video. I was at the hospital with my dad. And Becca sends me this video, and there's this all of a sudden utter quietness in the house, and she's looking for Whitney. Whitney, where are you? She comes into the bathroom and she's taking the video, following in. And there's Whitney standing up on the stool. She has my hair gel out and it's completely pasted all over her head. Becca says, are you fixing your hair, Whitney? Yeah. Does it look pretty? Yeah. Just mad. I mean, just gooed up, matted down. Becca knew what was happening. She knew that quietness meant that there was some type of mischievous actioning happening there. And it's not that God is not omnipresent and all-knowing and all-seeing, but rather it's that the writer of this scripture, the Hebrew writer, is trying to tell us that what is happening is the immaturity and the childlikeness of our very own hearts. And just like two children who are called on the carpet, They're too afraid of the consequences, so they begin the blame game. Adam even implying that it's not just Eve's fault, but maybe it's God's fault too because he put her here with him. Now please, I beg of you, never blame God for your sins. Please, please, bite your tongue if it causes bleeding to the fact that you would not blame God for your sin. It only causes more problems, I believe. And then we see the curses begin to ensue. The judgment is dealt out. Snake crawls on the ground and eats dirt, it says. I think this is obviously to some degree cryptic or at least a deeper meaning and irony of the fact that it was from the ground that dust, the man was created. And then when man dies, it's to dust that he goes again. So just in that fact, you see the enmity between the serpent and man himself, that it's condemned that the serpent would have to crawl through the remains of man himself. Who's the God of this world? Satan. And somehow he's condemned to live his life at this point in time among humanity that he is at absolute enmity with. Interesting, I think, to say the least. The woman has more pain at childbirth. Man works the cursed ground with thorns and thistles, and they are all banned from the garden. And I think the Genesis account can make us uh, 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 more wise, however. In the Genesis narrative of creation, we find not only the brokenness of creation, but we also find the resolution to creation. God is not fighting with other gods for control like the ancient Near Eastern gods are, but rather He is in control. The Genesis narrative shows us that God is over and above creation. He's not part of creation. He's not one with creation, but he is the supreme creator of creation. Now, this is important to remember that the scriptures from their Genesis show humanity that we need not worry or fear because God is the one who is handling creation, including you and I. 
And if we are submitted ourselves to God, then all of our allegiances lie at the foot of the cross, and neither you nor Satan nor the enemy have made any room on the earth for the fact that God is still in control. Not you. We should be blessed in knowing the fact that I'm not the one in control. But yet we grasp and grope for it, do we not? And we see the first part of God's intervention in Him being the one who makes the first couple's close as an act of grace and reassertion that the Creator's rights are there. The reality of the history of Jesus that we find in the Scriptures is that it was through suffering that Jesus conquered. Do you realize that? This is all encapsulated in our lives. If we're going to be like Jesus, there's a certain level of suffering that if we're going to be like Him, we have to realize Through suffering, Jesus conquers. And it's through the darkness of suffering that you realize how finite, how desperately in need of the presence of God you are. The presence of fear is this lack of the presence of faith, ultimately, that God is handling your life well. And the reality is that even though Satan, the world, and the enemy may be trying to destroy your life, God has the greater ability to turn it out for good in this life and ultimately in the one to come. Now, most certainly, the fig leaves that you try to cover up your sin with are withering and unraveling. At their best, fig leaves, maybe perhaps at the time the largest leaf in all of the Garden of Eden, Eden, were the most uh, appropriate to try to cover up nudity. However, they would have made at their best skimpy coverings, to say the least. Just like any attempt to cover up your sin is futile, And leaves little to the imagination. God sees your sin. And so does everybody else. You cannot keep it hidden from God. So God takes leather it says. And he makes clothes for you. He provides a way for you to no longer feel shame and nakedness. And to feel fear. There however is only one place that leather comes from. God had to take the lifeblood from an animal at that time. Never done before. No animal has ever died at this point in time. Perfection of all creation, and yet God takes the animal, sacrifices it, removes the skin, prepares it, gives it to the animal, Adam and Eve, and provides a way for their shame and their fear and their nakedness to be covered and taken away. And so it was that 2,000 years ago, on a place called Calvary, God took His very own Son, And sacrifice them on the cross so that you can be free of shame and wickedness and fear and nakedness that your life has been plagued by for so many years. And it happened through the brokenness of his very own son, the Lamb of God. You see, Jesus did not just lay his life down and passively give it to the evils of the world. Although God used, obviously, the evil of the world that his son might be crucified. But it was for the purpose of his death that he made it possible for us to confront the evil of death itself. There was defeat in Jesus' death, but the real defeat was not Jesus dying on the cross. It was Jesus defeating death itself. It was the day death died, it's the same day Jesus died. And you can be sure... That you can confront the evil of this world and all of the unknowns of life and the fear-mongering of the enemy because you were armed with the knowledge that Jesus has been there through the darkest of all human evil experience that you will ever encounter. And we too can conquer through the darkest places of life because we have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in us, living in us. We have the ability to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, Jesus' very own Spirit, to fill us to the fullness. And if Jesus was able to confront all the wicked deeds of the world in the throes of the enemy, then certainly we should be able to and empowered by the fact that we can confront all of the wicked evils of the world too. That people fear what they do not know. But the beauty of Christianity is, is that it's all held up in the end. 
And if it's all held up in the end, then we know where our creator exists in the end, transcendent over all time and space. And so you do not have to fear the future, the unknownness of the future, what may or will happen, because we know that God is already there. So let me leave you with this very simple story. Pastor Hammond uh, was going to surgery on uh, Thursday, right before this uh, heart catheterization process. Twenty years ago, the man had triple bypass surgery, so there's no telling what they could obviously find. He's having chest pains off and on. He didn't ignore the signals, and he went to the doctor. He has the heart cath, obviously, on Thursday. They did stint him. There was something going on with the 99% blockage, as I already said. But he said in the early hours of the morning, the day of the heart cast, he began to feel fear. He was unnerved and unsettled. So he says he got up, he opened up the scriptures, and he began to pray. And he said the Lord took all of that fear and unnerving away. And the truth is, is that what stems from all fear is the fact that our relationship with God has been broken somewhere. Some place our faith has been broken. And all we are in need of is uniting that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ once again. Repairing that relationship. So bow your heads and close your eyes. If you are struggling with fear of something in your life this morning, would you just raise your hand as an acknowledgement, not to me, but to the Lord. A fear of the unknown, a fear of what the possibilities of the future could be. Whatever it may be, thank you for those hands. I appreciate that. Lord sees that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke all fear in every form and every fashion. I bind it in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said my words in your mouth. I'm just going to speak your words in the name of Jesus to them, Lord God. You rebuke sickness and you rebuke disease. You just talk to it like it was a dog. And Lord, I speak to that fear right now in the name of Jesus. And I command you to go and get away from their lives. And Father, I pray that whatever at the heart of that fear is, the brokenness of relationship that they're dealing with in their lives, Lord, that this moment right now, they would be empowered and quickened by the Holy Spirit, that that Fear would be eliminated because they have repaired their relationship with you, Jesus. If there's somebody in here that doesn't know the Lord, I pray that you would just say the simple words this morning. Jesus, I need you. I want to know you. Forgive me. I need to know you. That's it. Man, how simple is that? And Father, I pray that you would just begin working in our lives and in our church. Father, that you would uh, rebuke all fear of the future. And, Father, we would know and have confidence in our spirits, Lord God, that you are there and there's nothing to fear. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.